Welcome back to BRB Gaming. Today, Imz and I, the Nerdy Dad, are talking with the face of Macho Nacho Productions and console modding aficionado Tito. We'll talk about the channel, retro consoles, the funds of modding, and the best queso for nachos. No? I guess we'll stick to video games then. So um, first and foremost, Tito, congratulations on hitting that ever-present 20K milestone um, and still climbing pretty well. H how does it feel? Uh, I mean, you know, it feels it feels good. Um, you know, I kind of hit, hit some luck there with, uh, with the Unhinged video, the Unhinged SP. Um, but, you know, I mean, honestly, it's it's been a really rewarding and, like, fulfilling process. Um, been doing it over... A year now um and yeah the community is just really great so uh, honestly it's just been a really really awesome journey so far yeah being a part of those premieres on uh thursday the community is is pretty engaged and i can imagine that's that's a humbling feeling knowing that so many people come out and mm -hmm. and watch live the the premiere of the video and see you know and mostly probably just speak with you and get your thoughts as it as it goes on yeah absolutely no it's it's definitely uh I, i'm actually really surprised how engaged the audience is um it always just like surprised me the questions they ask and um it's just it's just really awesome yeah, yeah. how has your how's your week been uh pretty good can't complain you know i have my my uh nine to five that i do every day and then i come back and i pretty much work on youtube videos uh, nice. until I go to bed. So, um, and, uh, yeah. And, uh, Eames, how, how are you, sir? Good to have you on again. Thank you, sir. I'm very good. Nice. How, how's your week been treating you? My week's been great. Uh, I had a bunch of stuff that I was trying to sell and I sold it all. So I don't have any trades and so my collection is, is set right now. A nice homeostasis for consoles and games. So to talk about uh, got on the subject of uh, games, Tito, what what's the game that got you into gaming? And you being the handheld guy you are, was was it a handheld? Uh, so surprisingly, no. Um, it's actually that's actually a tough question. I was trying to think. Well, what was the first game that I played? And uh, I'm like 99 percent sure it was Sonic. Two Sonic the Hedgehog two for the Sega Genesis, and you know I had gotten that console. It was a present actually for my grandfather, and uh, the pack-in game was Sonic the Hedgehog. Um, and obviously, I instantly fell in love with it. It was great. Uh, we also had a PC in the house, a four eighty six. Uh, so we did play Doom, uh, uh, Wolfenstein. You know, uh, so. So I would say, so it, it's kind of muddy in my memory. So I don't exactly remember the first game, but I remember, you know, I loved playing Doom, loved Wolfenstein, loved Sonic. Um, and, and funny enough, also, I, I don't know, I guess I was kind of into the more, you know, adult, you know, violent video games. Mortal Kombat mm -hmm. was another game I played quite a bit when I was younger. Um, but uh, But I would say Sonic... The Hedgehog Two was the first one, uh, so it was a console. Yeah, yeah. When um, when I was a kid, the we had my parents had an Atari that they probably picked up from a garage sale, like way back when. Oh wow! So I I half remember those games, and then really it was the cliche Christmas, you know, got a Nintendo, lost my mind, stayed up until like <laughs> midnight playing it. Oh yeah. Um, I've had many nights like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but it was, it was Mario and jumping on Goombas, but probably yep. the, the cliche, every, every Nintendo kid story. I have to say I, I was a Sega kid growing up. Uh, um, cause yeah, soon after the Genesis, I, I actually got a, a game gear and I took that thing everywhere with me and I just, I just ate batteries 
but so, you know, I, I was a kid, right? So my parents got me the battery pack, you know, thinking, oh, we're going to save money on double A's. You know, I was a kid. I never recharged that thing. I just, I just kept on using the double A's. I kept on asking them for money to buy me new batteries. But um, I do remember having that battery pack, putting it on my belt because it had a little belt clip on it and then plugging it into the, to the game gear. Yeah. Another thing, eight, eight batteries like nothing else. So, so was it a trip down memory lane when you uh, did your, did your first recap? Oh um, yeah. So actually I've done a recap, the game gear. It, so the game gear wasn't the first recap that I did. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, whenever I, um, I recap a console, it's always like a really kind of scary thing. Cause you're not really sure if it's going to work when you turn it back on. Um, and that was, you know, that was kind of the first time I, I had done a game gear and I was like thinking, oh, I messed it up. Probably it won't turn on. And it did turn on and it worked. And that's like the best feeling ever. Uh, but yeah. So was that your, was that your like, wow, I did this thing moment? Uh, so the, wow, I did this moment. Uh, it wasn't the game gear. It was a recap, uh, job though. Um, but it was for a, PC engine uh, duo. Uh, it, so it's basically a, um, in the US, we called it the Turbo Duo. It was the PC engine with the CD module attached. And that one was about, uh, I want to say it was like, it was like over 50 capacitors. And, and I was so nervous because I was like, okay, you know, these are, there's over 50 capacitors here. I know I messed at least one of them up mm-hmm. and the whole thing won't work. And it's just going to be, this trial and error of going through each capacitor and seeing, but it, it worked. And I, that was probably the most elated I'd ever been doing a mod because yeah. It's about a hundred points of failure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> there are many single points of failure and you know, by God's grace, it just all worked out. <laughs> so yeah. Thank, thank goodness for that. Yeah. So, um, did uh was hardware modding and hardware work like always a thing for you or did it recently become a thing? So, so modding. So I want to say, so I've always, I've always loved collecting video games, collecting video game consoles and really the modding really mostly kind of started as um, refurbishing for me. So I would, um, there was a period of time, probably like 2012, where I would actively search for broken consoles or consoles that didn't work, and primarily cartridge-based consoles like an NES or a Super Nintendo or a Game Boy, even at that point. Because nine times out of ten, they're not broken; they just need to be cleaned. Uh, you know, clean the contacts of the cart reader. Or you know the battery uh, contacts; they just have a little bit of corrosion on them. Uh, so that so that's not really modding; it was more refurbing. I would say modding for me, um, it it, it kind of started with the recapping, and it was that uh, uh, that PC Engine duo, um, and then a Game Gear soon after, and then I really got the bug when uh, Benven came out with the Freckle Shack. I don't know if you guys remember that. I think that was like maybe 2000, nah, like 14, 15. Well, so in, so the, what was it? 2018. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Actually, you're, I'm, I'm thinking the AGS 101 that he oh, did yeah. first. Those, those, those is, ribbon cables. 17. Yeah. And then, yeah. So the Freckle Shack was probably when I really got into handhelds more. Um, Cause soon after, the freckle shack. I feel like we just got this huge explosion of backlighting mods. And, and now today it's just, it's China. They, they copycatted his design and made and blew it up with uh, a bunch of cheap mods. El cheapo. Yeah. So it's on, it's unfortunate. Um, and yeah, I, I really, you know, I can't stress enough. You really got to support, you know, the main designers of these mods at, I try to do it as best as I can. Uh, it's unfortunate. It's just, you know, the Chinese, they, they do it so quickly. They do it so cheaply. Um, and they're just all readily available. I mean, he sent his designs to China to get it, you know, printed. So of course they're going to take it and try to 
try to make it on the cheap. Right. And, and that's something I'm, I'm curious about. Like, I wonder is the cost savings of sending these and like kind of um, outsourcing it to China, uh, the cost savings of doing that, does it outweigh maybe doing it domestically? I mean, I, I know, I mean, I know in the US we have like a moderate industrial base where we can, you know, I think there's some websites here where we can actually get PCBs fabricated. But he's not from, uh, but he's not from America. Oh, you're right. He's from Australia. You're, mm-hmm. you're right. Um, so PCB way, uh, is is that is that American or is that Chinese? I I I, I only know about them from my YouTube advertisements, believe oh. it or not. So so um, yeah, it kind of that's sort of the one you know pitfall of you know sending these outsourcing it because yeah they get, they can get copied so easily and, and then resold. You know they don't really have to do that uh, R and D. They don't have to spend the money to do the you know the research and the designing of the chip. They just kind of copy paste and uh it it would be very it would be very similar for a hobbyist to do it though you can you can build any circuit it's just how well you can manufacture it yourself we we right right we three don't have the access to like being able to manufacture tiny circuit boards but we could build the same using like a giant breadboard just Mm -hmm. to understand the concept of it it's not efficient (laughs) but but it is possible and it's a shame that like now for i mean for example if boxy pixel their cnc files got leaked or something like you could push those to a shapeways or Mm -hmm. you know another um distributor of cnc and custom cnc for people Mm -hmm. and it's just all that all that artistry is basically a file now that can be passed passed around right yeah i'm i mean i'm not sure if he i actually don't know if he outsources i don't know if that's done outside of the united states or if he does that locally yeah i I mean it must because yeah haven't seen any copies so which is a good thing so i'm glad he's able to keep that ip protected and and great products from oh yeah from what i've seen i mean i'm a huge 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 fan no get out of town yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love his stuff now he does really amazing things and yeah your latest video was on a uh board by helder to make the yep. macro more accessible and mm-hmm. i was looking at that and it's just one more reason for me to find a ds to resurrect and make into this like beautiful beautiful piece of piece of functional you know art and entertainment yeah i like i would say the macro i mean it's i would say it's like my favorite form factor for the game boy advance i I love the unhinged I, i mean it's beautiful to look at um but the macro is just so thin you know the aesthetic is really nice. It looks like an old game and watch. Um, and I mean, I really, I guess the only uh, shortcoming is, you know, when you put an original Game Boy Advance game, it kind of has that little bump on the bottom. Yeah, which <laughs> it doesn't look great. But, you know, I play a lot of my games off a of flash card and the Easy, Easy Flash Omega has a special shell where it just sits mm-hmm. nice and flush and you have your entire library of games on there. Game Boy Advance, Game Boy Color the original Game Boy, and it even has an NES emulator. So it's just like a gi- ginormous library of games just in your pocket. But be careful, because if you don't, if you turn it off too soon, your game's gone. That's right. Yeah, make sure, yeah, you got to give it a couple of seconds after you save a game, for sure. I have corrupted many, many a save file. <laughs> um, but Much to but, lament about lost saves. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm too impatient. I don't. I. I can't. I haven't even tried picking one of those up because of that specific reason. Yeah. This is a uh, Crix man, correct? Yeah. Oh, oh. I wanted. I wanted the the shorty, the the Crix uh, GBA X Five mm-hmm. Mini. Since I first got back into Game Boys in 2017, and I I tweeted at him. I started a Twitter account just so I could tweet at him. And oh. finally, last year, it came out. Nice. Yeah. I mean, yeah, Crix makes great, great stuff. They're pricey, but honestly, I mean, they 
worth it. They do what they're supposed to. They work. Yeah. yeah. Worth it. Mm-hmm. yeah. Isn't that what we all just want? We want something that we can put in, we could turn on, it boots up quick, and it just works. So I use a Mac. I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding, Eames. Hey, man, I've been a, a Mac head for oh, okay. like 12, 13, 14 years. 2002, two, no, 2003 to last year. And when my, my little MacBook Air uh, kicked the bucket, the... The RAM died, so and I didn't want to try to open it and try to uh, hot hot air the the solder joints or no the yeah. what is it yeah the solder p- balls. I was doing so many virtual um, virtual computer stuff that I just got a PC just just for the heck of it. My wife still rocks the MacBook. It's it's very much that like boxy pixel like aesthetic, the very clean lines, the very it, I mean, they build a very nice product. It's again, it's pricey. It's pricey. Yep, yeah. it's worth it. But yeah. Uh, but yeah, he he puts a good product out there. So you you are getting what you pay for, for sure. So we kind of congratulated you to, in the beginning for it. But um, Tito, what sparked Macho Nacho Productions like be, coming into being? Like, did was it just like one day you were you know sitting in your car driving and you're like, you know what? <laughs> I'm gonna start a YouTube channel. That's a that's a great question. Um, so I've I've toyed with the idea of starting a YouTube channel for many 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 years. Um, I wasn't sure what it would be. Um, I didn't know it would be about video games or video game consoles or modding because uh, I've always had an interest in videography. So for the longest time. I've been making videos, uh, whether, you know, they're like little, you know, comedy sketches with my friends when we were in high school. Uh, it's just something I've always done, even even in middle school, middle school, high school, uh, college. Uh, there was a bit of a hiatus. Um, and then I picked it back up right around 2016. Uh, you know, I got myself a DSLR um, and I was like, you know what? I want to start making videos again. Um and it was actually also right around the same time I started grad school. And what I found is I enjoyed making like promotional videos for my classmates, for, you know, different student organizations or whatever, uh, for different uh, school functions. I enjoyed doing that more than the actual schoolwork. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, so it's just something I've always been interested in was, was videography. And of course, video games, I've, I've loved video games, you know, pretty much my whole life, the vast majority of my life. And honestly, YouTube is sort of like the perfect melding of the two where I can do two things I really, really enjoy. So that's, you know, video games, you know, modding video game consoles and uh, and film and videography. So. So once I graduated in 2019, I was like, you know what, I'm going to start a YouTube channel. So, yeah, I started it pretty soon after I graduated. I actually might have still still have been the last semester. Um and I uploaded the, uh, it was, it was a macro video. It was my first mm-hmm. video. Um, it wasn't really a how to, it was kind of like a, a montage type thing. I, I obviously, I still didn't know exactly what I was doing. Uh, but, but yeah, so that's, that was really kind of the whole genesis of everything was kind of my love for videography and my love of video games, especially retro, retro video. Games. The, the composition and the just the beauty of the intro shot for a retro n- renew is something that is so iconic and wow. the flow of it 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 is just is so good oh, man. Um, how you. it just blends in and phases and everything else and i can't can't think of a better way to start like an episode but to have that kind of hook like that really, like when you sit down, you watch one of your videos and that comes on, you know, even if you've never seen one of your videos before, you know, okay, this guy's got his stuff together. I'm about to see something high quality. And it doesn't matter if, you know, you went in, you're like, doesn't matter if I have one follower or a million followers, I'm going to go in putting my best foot forward. And it shows in every single video. 
I do. Thank you so much, man. That, that really means a lot. And, you know, and really like the whole community has been super supportive. You know, they, they say how much they love the videos and, and to me that, it, you know, it's just so rewarding. And to hear, you know, you guys say that, I mean, that just like means the world to me. And really it just gives me the energy to kind of just keep making the videos better and better, try new things, um, do cooler effects, you know, just cause you know, I have just as much fun making the video, you know, sometimes more fun making the video than doing the mod. The mod is like a stressful thing. That's like the most stressful part of the entire video making process is like, uh, if this has got to work, otherwise I don't have a video. Hey, your uh, Unhinged SP videos, you kept a cool head. I, I w- watched you do it. And when you were talking about it, you you could have fooled me, man. <laughs> well, so, um, I mean, not to give, I, I don't want to reveal too much what's going on behind the scenes. So a lot of that is voiceover after the fact, um, which is why which is why I sound so calm. So if I, if I was doing it live, there might be, you know, some, you know, adult language and I might get demonetized. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but, uh, and, uh, yeah, I, so if I do find something wrong, like when I'm installing or I notice something, I try to comment on it in the video, but the videos are a little deceiving. It does make the mods, I think sometimes look easier, uh, than they actually are. Um, but, uh. But part of, you know, part of that's, I, I'm also cognizant of the viewer's time, right? So mm-hmm. these, you know, when I film myself, it's a four or five hour ordeal and I got to mm-hmm. cut it into something where, you know, I'm conveying enough information where someone can reproduce this and do it on their own. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I also got to, you know, sort of keep their attention. So it's like that, finding that balance and. Uh, that kind of shot me in the foot. The. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the YouTubers make it easier than it actually is. By the way, though, yep. I did my DMG screen mm-hmm. like for a refresher. I went back and watched your video oh, and awesome. uh, saw the not using the gasket to stick the screen down, but as a dust barrier, mm-hmm. I was like, that's something that I didn't think about. Yeah. Um, so I ended up doing that, but I shot myself in the foot twofold because before I got into modding, um, I watched a bunch of videos, but for YouTube, I watch videos at around like one and a half times speed because there's mm. so much content on the right. internet. So I'm yep. like, wow, these guys are just like blazing through <laughs> soldering, like first time joints are perfect <laughs> and totally gave me the wrong idea about like what modding was. So mm-hmm. I, tr- the first mod that I tried to do was a retro six clean power board for a DMG. Okay. And I roasted one of the via rings for the power line just straight out of it and i was like there's no saving this and then talking to eames and then another member of our forum uh jacqueline he was like dude just scrape back you know do you do you know like how to repair a trace i'm like no he's they were like no scrape back find some copper throw some flux down on there and then just like pray and, you know, put a line to it and get connected. And sure enough, you know, I got it back working. However, the, the way that that power board is situated in the casing, Mm -hmm. a joint like that, there's no way to sustain that for a long period of time. Mm. There's just, if you hot glue it, the hot glue gives it too much thickness. So the board doesn't fit in anymore Mm -hmm. and you have to secure it somehow. But is very much one of those things like sitting outside, you know, the casing and having it all put together and turned down and at work. It was elating to to know that I did that with his little skill. And it was um, it was inspiration to keep moving forward. I mean, I, that, that's a pretty sophisticated thing you did. I mean, you know, peeling away some of the solder mask and then soldering to a trace. That's uh, that's not an easy thing to do. So, I mean, kudos to you for for doing that. <laughs> That's, um, that's what I hear. I don't think it was a big deal though. <laughs> hey, Hey, you did it, man. That's all that matters. So, yeah. um, but, uh, but yeah, no, I mean, I, I mean, there are so many nuances when soldering. Um, I, I am planning on doing like a solder lesson type video because, you know, like you said, a, a novice, they may watch a video. Oh, this is easy. I can just solder this. But then their dwell time is too long and they roast a via or something. Mm-hmm. And then 
that's it game over or unless you know they can you know scrape off some of the solder mask and solder to a trace or something um but kind of yeah, like the nuances like temperature you know when you're dealing with different size pads or if you're dealing with like a ground plane you got to use more heat there, there's so many little things you kind of um hope the viewer understands and and, and that's kind of one of the things that i i I would like to convey in a video, uh, but it would just take so much time. And it's like, do I have to do, can I do it in every video? Probably not. It would just wouldn't, it wouldn't be feasible time-wise. And, um, but, but again, I am planning on doing kind of like a quick tips for soldering just so, you know, cover your bases, make sure people are aware of some of the things that can go wrong and what they can do to avoid it. So something that I found when, when I started, um, I use the um, Adam of Mythbusters um, ideology for tools. And his his ideal is like, if you need something for a job, buy the cheapest possible thing that you can find. And if you use it enough until you break it, then you buy the best possible version of that because you know you're going to use it. So, and there are the budget that I had for my tools when I started like ballooned a lot and mm -hmm. I was starting to get dirty looks from my wife because <laughs> I have a bad habit of like jumping from one hobby to another. Um, but it, it's good to, it's good to know like from someone who does know what they're doing and does do it on a regular basis. What, what tool is the tool? If you're serious about it, if you just want to get, you know, mm -hmm. an idea of if you like yep. it, um, I really, I look forward to that video because um, I'll probably learn something from it. All right. <laughs> yeah. Now, that, now that's a really good mantra. Cause yeah, you don't want to dive, you know, head first and buy the most expensive like soldering station. And then you find out ah, you don't like the hobby. I mean, I think that's a good way to, yeah. Once you kind of use, get to the limits of the tool that you do have, then yeah, you can upgrade and, get to that next one. So that's a, no, that's good advice. I like that. Eames, I think you, you hit that recently. Um, what, what was it you got the, the consoleizer? I got the kit for the consoleizer and I've yet to put it together. Uh, it's too, is it the GBA, the GBA, the GBA consoleizer? Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. Awesome. I just been, uh, slacking on, on doing that. I saw Voltaire's, um, video on it and it, it seems pretty legit. I got a, a new solder station that has been doing pretty, pretty, pretty good. And I feel like I have, nice. I have some, some junk Game Boy um, Pokemon that I need to try to uh, get to work. And once I finish this project, I think I'll be able to be confident enough to solder that. Cause these, these little bits are really, really tiny. Yeah, the, the GBA consoleizer, that's definitely a project I want to do at some point. Um, that's a really cool, a really cool mod. So Yeah, I remember trying to pick, I was helping Eames out because the site, of course, with everything with COVID, um, was up and down throughout the day. And uh, Eames, I don't know if you purposefully meant to order three or if you accidentally ordered three. I did not. <laughs> I, I added to my cart and... When it was time to check out, I saw that I had three in my cart, and I'm like, if I if I uh, go back, it's going to kick me out of the oh, line, no. and whoever whoever's behind me is going to hop on, and it's probably going to be sold out. So I'm I'll just order three. So I have three kits that I you still have to put together. Oh my gosh! Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so hopefully, uh, once I get my own kit going, I'll do the other two and help me fund some other projects that I have planned because those go for a pretty penny a complete one goes for 500 to 600 dollars on ebay really that's, yeah that's a large number yeah Jeez. <laughs> oh wow i had no idea i gotta do it i gotta do it before uh the uh um the analog pocket comes out because apparently that one's gonna kill all these kind of mods yep fortunately that got pushed back true that's true so I, I still have some time. That's going to buy me some time before I, before the the value goes significantly lower. Yep. 
I think we covered it before, but um, what what are your favorite consoles? So, so that's a, that's a really good question. It's I had a tough. I mean, I, it's hard for me to choose one. Um, so I might choose a couple. Uh, I would say definitely the Dreamcast is up there. Um, uh, one of my favorite games is, is, is on the Sega Dreamcast. It's uh, Shenmue. I don't know if you guys have played Shenmue. The creator of the Quick Time event. That's right. Yep, the QTEs. We can thank uh, Shenmue for that. But uh, yeah, so Dreamcast is definitely there. It sort of kind of holds like a special place for me just because I got that launch. So 1999. 999. Yeah, 999, 1999. Although I didn't get it uh, in that month. I got it in, it was Christmas. It was a Christmas mm-hmm. gift. So um, so Dreamcast for sure. Um, if we're staying with home consoles, I would also have to say the original PlayStation. Um, a lot of good RPGs, um, Final, all the Final Fantasies. I played all of them. Um, I was a big RPG guy, but then Resident Evil, I'm a huge survivor horror fan. So Resident Evil was big for me. So, you know, Resident Evil 1, 2, 3, um, and, and even some of the offshoots like Dino Crisis, those other survivor horrors, uh, Parasite Eve, those types of things. Getting into the handhelds, I'd say the uh, original Game Boy is probably my favorite. Although I know you're going to say, I, so I did, you know, I had the, had the Game Gear first. So that definitely holds nostalgia for me. Um, but I have to admit the Game Boy had better games <laughs> for sure. It didn't have a color screen, um, but it definitely had really, really good games. And when Pokemon came out, I mean, that was actually the main reason I got a Game Boy. Uh, I didn't have a DMG. I actually got the Pocket. I came in late enough, and that that was the one that I had. I had a green Game Boy Pocket and Pokemon Blue, and I played that all the time. I brought it to school, played it all the time. My buddy had Red, so we would trade Pokemon and and everything. So I would say, for sure, handheld Game Boy Pocket. Um. Yeah, so I guess really, uh, I, I mean, I love a whole, I mean, I love all the consoles, to be honest. If I had to choose like a favorite handheld, it would be the, the Game Boy Pocket. Yeah. So you, you have some obscure ones in your collection. Mm-hmm. Uh, going through some of the episodes on your channel, there's the PC Game Engine handheld. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So the, so the PC Engine GT. Okay. Or as it was called in the United States, the uh, Turbo Graphics Express. So we actually got that in the U.S. Believe it or not, of course it didn't do well. Uh, it was ungodly expensive. Um, definitely not meant for children. I mean, c- unless you were, unless you came from like a really wealthy family or something. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so so I have the Japanese variant, the PC Engine GT, and that that's kind of a bit of an obscure console. I I want to say it was the first. Um, home console that was made portable. So, you know, we got the the Sega Nomad uh, several years after that. Basically, it's a portable portable Genesis. Um, but as far as I know, it's it was kind of like the first, you know, basically you could bring the home experience on the go with you. It fits those big floppies in there? Yeah, well, well, so uh, the the hue cards they're actually they're like credit card size, I so they're, they're 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 pretty pretty small. So they they added the the ROM into a different medium. Yes, yeah. So it was kind of like it's a really interesting. Like I think they use those uh, glob tops. You know, you see some Nintendo games come. It's a it's like a the a black club, epoxy yeah. instead of just like a, a standard you know EEPROM or something. Um, but yeah, that's definitely a really unique. I, I love that console to death. I mean, I had I had no idea something like that like that existed until you know maybe just a few years ago. Um, but uh, definitely didn't know about that. I didn't even know about the turbo uh, turbo graphics as a kid. I mean, it wasn't even on my radar. Um, I mean, I didn't know until some guy made a YouTube video. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, there's some pretty obscure consoles out there. I mean, that that's probably one of the more obscure. You know, things that we didn't even get here in the U.S., the the Wonder Swan, you know, that's a pretty obscure one. Um, I knew of its, of its existence. I just got one. And, and actually, to tell you the truth, I, I got the 
PC Engine GT, uh, the Neo Geo Pocket Color, um, and the Wonder Swan. I mean, pretty much I use the channel as an excuse. I'm like, oh, these are things I've always wanted, but I just never wanted to spend the money on. It's like, oh, now I have this YouTube channel. I'm going to buy these things um, and sort of experience them. And they're definitely a unique experience and they're, they're all really cool in their own right. And I just, anything retro electronics, I just love. Um, so I do love consoles, but I do collect other things as well. So I did hear too, the wonder Swan, um, is getting a flash card. Yeah. So, uh, I think it's already out the flat, the flash master. I know they made, uh, that, that company made one, I think for the Neo Geo pocket color for the Neo Geo pocket. I think they also kind of just released one for, for the wonder Swan, although it's kind of limited. I'm not sure if it has an external like flash media. So I don't know if you can put an SD card. I don't know too much about it. Mm -hmm. Um, But from what I understand, I think you can only put a few games on it. Maybe I could be right. I don't know. This is like, reminds me of the old uh, DS flash cards that had the micro SD uh, ports on them. They Mm -hmm. actually had to plug into your computer before SD cards were so prolific. Oh, (laughs) yeah. I remember. I remember looking at those and I was like, "Uh, I'll wait until they take a card or something before Mm -hmm. going down that rabbit hole. Um, It's funny that you mentioned the Dreamcast because you did that whole, you know, two part series on making the making the ultimate Dreamcast Um, and on kind of that line, like what would be if you could, what would be the next ultimate console that you would want to make? So the next one, and I'm actually going to do this, um, it, it's going to be the PlayStation, the original PlayStation. Um, so that's going to be coming soon. So stay tuned for that. Uh, but again, it's going to use the same, you know, um, the PS1 digital. You know, I did the DC digital for the Dreamcast. I'm definitely going to do the PS1 digital uh, for the PlayStation. Uh, and then obviously I'll also be doing, you know, an optical drive emulator, uh, I'm going to go with the X station. I know there's a couple solutions for that. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I would love to get a new shell, uh, for the PS one, but there's really no, um, no one's really making those. I think there was one or, or there's like a couple for, for sale on eBay, but they were ungodly expensive. And they were from like, uh, apparently they were, there were aftermarket shells, uh, made out of Venezuela, like like many, many years ago. And this is just uh, new old stock. So these things are like over a decade years old. Wow. Uh, but the problem from what I understand is, you know, they're so old and they kind of use a cheaper plastic. The plastic on those are actually pretty brittle. So uh, you may run into issues with screwing in uh, a screw in like one of the screw posts and it could just break off. So it, it's probably for the better to not get that. Plus they're very expensive because, you know, they're clear and they look very cool. But uh, so, yeah, uh, the next ultimate console will most likely be the PS one. Yeah. One that also holds, um, holds a place in my heart. Uh, I remember playing the greatest uh, RPG at the time, in my opinion, uh, mm-hmm. legend of Dragoon on there. It's the, it's the first like JRPG style game that I beat from beginning to end um, with only the aid of, a guide not having to hand the controller to like mm-hmm. my best friend who knew strategy very well or knew where everything was. So nice. Yeah. And yeah, there are so many good RPGs on the PS one. I never played legend of Dragoon. Uh, mostly I just stuck with like final fantasy and, uh, but uh, it's a powerhouse for RPGs. That's for sure. Indeed. Eames, do you have any memories from the PS1? Oh, yeah, man. I skipped the uh, Game Boy Color specifically because of PlayStation 1. One of my best trades was uh, my neighbor had Final Fantasy 7, but he didn't have a memory card. So I traded him Crash 1 for his Final Fantasy 7, and that was legit. Like, I love that game, and... Being that I was in high school, I didn't have responsibilities. I was immersed in like RPGs, like the the JRPGs and and, and the PlayStation are some of the best. Uh, Lunar, uh, Sudoku, uh, what is it, Sudoken? Suikoden. Suikoden, yeah, Suikoden. It was a sweet, su- 
Yeah, Suikoden. Yeah. Suikoden. They have so many good RPGs. A lot, lot of good titles, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. even some some remakes. They had Chron- a Chrono Trigger and stuff like that. Yes. Yeah, yes. with the uh, Toriyama FMVs. That's right, Akira Toriyama. It, actually, that was... My, I remember my buddy, really good friend of mine in high school, he actually imported that. I was so jealous. I was like, dude, that is so cool. Yeah. Um, I actually have an interesting story about the PS1. Go ahead. Um, so I didn't have one growing up, but my next door neighbor did. And uh, Final Fantasy Nine. You know, people have been talking about it. It's, it was kind of going around in the in the magazines at the time. It was being advertised. Hadn't come out in the U.S. yet, but I imported uh, through eBay. It was my first eBay purchase, and it was the most sketchy thing ever because it was a bootlegged Final Fantasy IX in Japanese. So when I was playing it, I had no idea what was going on. Um, but anyway, it was a. I basically mailed the guy cash. Oh, no, no, no. It was a. Um, Money order. I mailed him a money order because, you know, this was eBay way, way a long time ago where you could do money orders. Money order. I remember that. Yeah. It, it was so long ago. It was a long time. And, and actually, funny enough, I think I messed up on the money order and I think I was like short a quarter. So I taped a quarter to a piece of cardboard and I just mailed it to the guy. And uh, I eventually did get the game. It was bootlegged. And the way I played it, was uh, you, you guys remember game FAQs? Um, yes. Game, so, so someone had published a uh, a walkthrough, and I basically had a a walkthrough. It was like this thick. It was a whole ream of paper, and I just played the game. I had no idea what I was, you know. Re- I was just kind of trying to understand the story through reading this game facts and just following the instructions on where to go and how to beat the enemies. Uh, but that was a ton of fun. I remember doing, I would like kind of after school or on weekends, I would go over to the neighbors and uh, that's what I would do. But it's fantastic. Yeah. That's awesome. So, the links we go to play the games. I, I know. Yeah. In, I, I sold all my PlayStation games. I sold all my collection growing up. And when I was in college, I had a security, jo- uh, security guard job and I was stationed at the front, the front uh, entrance uh, during the day shift, and it was some of the bo- most boring time uh, I have ever had. So one of the, my friends who I sold all my stuff to, I asked him if he could send me my PlayStation 1 O O N E with the little flop flip top uh, screen, and I tried to play Final oh, Fantasy yeah, yeah. 7 there, yeah, yeah. and it wasn't the same, man. It was because I, I have distractions and mm-hmm. like homework and stuff like that. It, it, it's not the same as growing up and having no yep. responsibilities once i'm off of school like my life is mine you know yep that's right <laughs> you know now being you know being father zeems and i the the time that we have to play games is is very limited and cherished cherish those moments that you have to play your games dear listeners out there yeah actually so you know as we get older we you know, we have less time to play these things. So I started gravitating away from those kind of longer games. Like I haven't played Final Fantasy since 13. Um, I just don't have time, you know, school or work. Uh, so I've been kind of playing the shorter uh, games you can kind of beat in, you know, maybe 20 hours or so. Um, that's a great thing with a lot of the games for the Switch, like, you know, Super Mario Odyssey. That's something I could just beat, you know, a couple afternoons and um, get a couple moons yes. in in between. Yeah, that's right. So. so a lot we've talked a lot about the retro hand retro handhelds that uh, we love and modding them and everything else. Like there has been, we kind of bring this up every now and again um, on the cast. There's been this explosion of of clone consoles and um, just consoles that um, the RG three fifties and the retroid pockets and all these different consoles come out. And are those, do you think those are options for people that want to get to get into retro gaming rather than um, buying the consoles secondhand and modding them to kind of meet the IPS screen standard that mm-hmm. we have now for ourselves? Oh, yeah. I mean, 100%. I think 
I think those are fantastic options for people. I mean, because, you know, you just kind of pick it up and you can play it and you can enjoy the games. Because, you know, unfortunately, you know, the way the retro uh, retro game sort of scene is now, everything is just so ungodly expensive and it's only getting worse. So really the only way for people to sort of enjoy these things is, you know, through like emulation, um, through devices like the RG350 um, or a lot of those kind of clone consoles. So I think they're, I think they're great. Um, I mean, for, you know, folks like you and me who sort of grew up with these things, it is nice to have original hardware, or if you're lucky enough, you didn't sell your, you know, the stuff that you grew up with. I, I mean, I unfortunately sold a lot of my stuff, you know, it was just part of the, part of the, yeah, yeah, part of the nature of the beast. So you can buy the next greatest, but, mm-hmm. but yeah, no, I mean, 100% the, uh, those emulation handhelds or consoles, it's a perfect, it's a great option for people to, you know, who are maybe new to retro games to sort of get introduced to, you know, this whole genre, um, you know, yeah. So, yeah, I feel the same way. It's, it's one of those things where there's so many, there's so many good games. We're in a, we're in an era that there's too many good games. It's not even that there's too many games. There's too many good games to play and people should experience the older games if they gravitate towards that and any number of means to be able to do that um, Mm -hmm. i i support and they're those devices are only getting more powerful which which is crazy for the prices that they're asking for them yeah but i i think eames will agree with me and you do as well like there's just something even if you never experienced it before there's something about picking it up the way that it was originally meant to be like slapping in the cartridge, you know, flicking that hard switch and that machine that is almost as old as I am still Mm -hmm. doing the thing it was designed to do. Yep. Worth it. I'll pay the price. (laughs) Pay the price. Yes. The, the $80 machine that can play all the games or the $80 video game that's a single cart, a single ROM. I, I'll pick the single ROM now. <laughs> just to have it. Just to, just to, just to, just to look at it. Just to the, look at it. On the and, shelf. Then, and then put it in its case and then put it at the bottom of my drawer and then get the flash card in and play the exact same game. <laughs> yeah. So for, for young modders, you know, I we talked about i completed my first mod i'm very proud of myself right now but for the younger modders that haven't cut their teeth yet what uh what would you think would be a good first first mod for someone that's a tough one um i would say you know maybe just to kind of you know get acquainted to modding maybe something that doesn't require soldering because soldering is something you want to work up to and uh it's a skill on on its own uh but there's a lot of really great mods that don't require soldering um i think a really really good one uh would be you know a game boy color backlight so you have a lot of these tft sort of kits where um sure you get a smaller screen but uh but you get a backlit screen and and honestly if if I was a kid and I had a backlit Game Boy Color like that, I wouldn't get any sleep at night. Um, so I think a really good mod would be those sort of, uh, you know, kind of all in one TFT LCD kits for the Game Boy Color. I mean, you can get like a complete with the bra- with the bracket. So you don't even have to worry about trimming your shell. You can get the 3D printed bracket, the screen, um, you know, the PCB, everything you need. Uh, console five has a great kit for that. Um, t- I mean, you can go on eBay, but that's a really good mod just to kind of get yourself introduced, I think. Um, and then if you want to do more complex ones, you know, uh, there are a ton of options. So, yeah, I, f- I feel like, um, if you're brave, if you, if you're, if you're really brave on what you can do and you have some sacrificial shells lying mm-hmm. around, mm-hmm. uh, a cut mod, you know, mm-hmm. might might be a good first mod. 
Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it is it is one of those things. If you haven't worked with plastics, or if like that one shell is the only shell you have, and you're not getting another one. Yep. Um, it is. It can be intimidating if you don't have the right tools to do it. But I did not. Um, I was not aware of that. Like all in one TFT kit. Um, yeah. But yeah. if I pick up a color, I I might consider it. Yeah. No, they're they're fantastic. It's uh, it's a bit smaller, so you don't get a full size screen replacement and uh, basically that dead space where the screen would sit it's there's a 3d printed bracket you just lay it on top it centers the screen perfectly you're good to go so fantastic yeah. fantastic Come on, everybody! well that is all i had uh eames did you uh did you have any questions that you wanted to throw out there for the good of the order no nothing <laughs> no <laughs> Uh, yeah, it, I mean, it's great having you, Tito, and I, I agree with you on the TFT GBC. They also have a GBC, GBA drop in uh, now. They recently came out with one, where it's uh, if you you just have to position it just right, and you'll be able to see the entire screen on a regular um, a regular uh, screen lens. That's a good option for limited editions. Yep. Yeah, I, I have a feeling you may be seeing something about that from me pretty soon. But yes, there is a good drop-in solution for the GBA. Sounds yep. good. And Tito, thank you so much for being on. I really appreciate you taking the time yeah. to talk to us today. Absolutely. Dave Beams, thank you for having me here. You know, this was a lot of fun. It's great talking to you guys. So where can the lovely people find you on the internet? So I am all over the place. Uh, you can find me uh, Facebook, Instagram at Macho Nacho Productions. I'm also on Twitter. Uh, it's a little bit different. It's Macho Nacho Media, uh, and of course YouTube, uh, Macho Nacho Productions. So awesome! Be sure yeah. to check him out at all the areas and drop him follows and subscriptions there. I am, of course, David, aka the Nerdy Dad. That's T-H-E-E-N-E-R-D-Y-D-A-D. You can find me on Twitch and Twitter on that handle, as well as right here on BRB Gaming every now and again. We publish every week, Wednesday, sometimes Thursday. And be sure to follow, subscribe, whatever podcasts you. Hey, I've been at this for a little while. I still don't know how it works. It's okay, though. Anyways, it's been a pleasure. Once again, be well, everybody. Uh, we gon' give it to you. 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 Uh, we gon' give